we've called this series Meeting Our Moment. And so wherever you are, I hope you'll enjoy meeting these remarkable people and meeting our moment through them. For this episode, I was fortunate enough to speak to no less than three artists of faith, each of them associated with perhaps the greatest of America's orchestras, the Boston Symphony. John Farillo has been principal oboe of the orchestra for almost 20 years, and before that was for 15 years principal of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra in New York. Something of a legend in oboe circles and revered as a teacher, he has played in virtually every concert venue in the United States, as well as worldwide. Often on the podium of the Boston Symphony is the conductor Thomas Wilkins. Thomas is the orchestra's artistic advisor in education and community engagement. Indeed, he's known as one of the most inspiring speakers and teachers in the business, especially among young people. Receiving in 2018, the Leonard Bernstein Lifetime Achievement Award for the Elevation of Music in Society. In addition to his duties at Boston, he's also music director of the Omaha Symphony and principal conductor of the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra. Elizabeth Klein is associate principal flute of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and principal flute of its sister orchestra, the Boston Pops. She's in wide demand as a teacher, serving on the flute faculty of Boston University and has had many newly written pieces dedicated to her. With strong academic interests, she holds a degree from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, and I'm glad to say serves on the advisory board of Duke Initiatives in Theology and the Arts. In talking to these three, I found that what struck me most was the way they cared passionately, not just about performing well, as you would expect, but about sharing with others what they have found in the world of classical music especially with those who might normally never go near it. Even more, they all seem to take it for granted that music goes very naturally, hand in hand, with an intelligent and lively Christian faith. I've been so looking forward to this conversation. Thank you very much. For those who don't know the classical music world well, either inside or from the outside, tell us a bit about what it's like to be a classical musician. What are the upsides? What are the biggest thrills? What do you what do you live for, as it were, John? <laughs> what don't I like about it? You right. Know? I've been thinking so much about the subject of what we love and what has been denied to us, and therefore love more intensely. Yeah. yeah. And and how it relates to our attitude towards faith. And I would say that the most important thing about those things is they're so wired into us the intangibles of it, you know? The fact that yeah. I can't explain why music communicates to me and how, how it communicates to me and how I communicate through it, or at least in a very complete way, is one of the reasons that it's so powerful. Really? It, it emulates our search for the Lord trying to understand faith better. There's nothing that comes closer than me to music that uses every single thing in my mind and in my heart. And, and teaching kids to play music better is a similar process. But the search for beauty in music is, is such a close cousin to the search for truth in faith. Elizabeth, what's it like being in the middle of an orchestra? Well, just to drop on what, what John said, I think when when you're playing just a really great work in a symphony orchestra with with really great musicians on stage, there really is just this sense of being caught up into something so much greater than yourself. Yeah. Um, on the one hand, you have to have all all the intensity of of the training and the practice and the concentration and and the listening. And in in that sense, there's very much uh, an individual focus, intense focus on on what you yourself are doing. But it's all it really is all for the greater good. It's because i I, I love this piece of music 
so much that I I want to um, I want to do right by by my other colleagues who sound so amazing on this piece. I want to communicate it to the audience. I um, want to give them something that they'll be excited by. And so, one of the bizarre things about this whole long shutdown, I think we've we've tried to do what we can as much as we can to stay involved with other musicians and and with with teaching, sometimes solo performing, sometimes little groups. But that sense of, of really coming together, that sense of also the, the excitement. It's funny what, what happens in, in, in a live performance. There are all these just tiny little communications that happen between player to player, between conductor and, and player. Um, that, that John said, you're, you're not communicating verbally. They, they happen very much in, in the moment. Yeah. Um, and that 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 experience can only be had through that experience. There really, there really is 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 nothing like it. I mean, it's an orchestra is is a team. It, it really is a great a great team. Thomas, I know you've actually you're of course I know you've played a great deal, but you, you're a conductor. I mean, that's an experience very few of us will ever uh, you know ever I, have. I I have the, the the luxury and the privilege now, especially being in Boston, working with some extraordinary musicians, uh, two of which are on the screen, and I worked with both of them uh, it, with with some significant pieces of music. So that's a that that's I, I count that as a gift. There was a moment um, I was speaking of Holst that, that we were talking about before we started this uh, in the, in the movement Jupiter. Mm-hmm. Well, let me back up because. Um, one of the one of one of the seminal events of my growing up was the day that my mother told me I was old enough to walk downtown to the public library by myself, uh, and that was a big deal to me because that's where all the classical music was. We didn't have any albums in my house, you know, that I could listen to. I could go to the library, and and the planets was one of those pieces, and Jupiter was one particularly, especially the hymn in the middle of the movement. Yep. And so I've always been really attached to that in Mahler's first symphony. There was, I just wore the grooves out of the library's albums. Um, and so I'm now a grown up and I'm guest conducting uh, a concert and my wife is there and she happens to be sitting in the audience beside my father-in-law, who is a retired pastor, uh, and my pastor. Um, and in the performance, in, that, in the middle of that hymn, I just stopped conducting. And my hands just sort of stayed here. And from a technical standpoint, I was trying to communicate to the orchestra that I trusted them to carry the ball at this point. But I also wanted to give them a sense of the grandeur of the moment. Yeah, yeah. But I was also deeply worshiping. And my wife said to me later that her, my father-in-law looked at her and said, what's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> And she looked at him and said, oh, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I, I, I think for me, that's the beauty of it. And I love it when I, I had a lady once come up to me and she said the magic words. She, she goes, she had never been to an orchestra concert before. And she had just heard a, a performance of Tchaikovsky Five or something. And she said, oh, my gosh, I had no idea. And that's what brings me joy that's about, being a, about, about being a classical musician is having someone c- discover uh, something really better about themselves. Thanks, that's terrific. You mentioned Mahler One there. There's a in the last movement of Mahler One. Oh. There's a, a moment. It's just a, I think it's the upper strings playing this extraordinarily simple melody. I remember a reviewer on the radio once saying that the way a conductor handles that is the key <laughs> to the whole thing, basically. Yeah. And that's another, it's another passage I've often thought in terms of prayer and worship, actually, um, myself. Of course, also, presumably, when you're actually doing your job well, that's also your worship. That's also oh, yeah. doing, doing what you were made for, even though you might not have your mind on, on yeah. God. Or well, I so. can tell you that uh, I think that the only explanation I can come up with for where God has put me in this business and... Uh, the things God has given me in this business is, is a direct result of the fact that God has called me to this. This is not my, this is not my occupation. It's my calling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and because of that, um, it informs how I approach study. It, inform, it informs how I relate to players in the orchestra. It informs how I relate to 
uh, people in the audience. You know, I, I it's, it's 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 a weird thing, but before every season starts at my own orchestra in Omaha, I stand in the empty concert hall before anybody gets there, and I scan all the seats and I pray for whoever will sit in those seats mm. that they will be transformed before the year is over. That's I, a wonderful thing, actually. For what it's worth. I, as a teacher, that's what I do in the in the empty lecture hall before every, <laughs> every class. Every class, just the same thing. Actually, it's very. I think it's a wonderful thing that you do that for as a performer as well. I, I say that all the time. The most important people in the room at a concert are not sitting on stage. Um, they are they're 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 sitting in the audience. And mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, I I said to our staff, our entire staff at the BSO. In a, in, a, in, a, in a Zoom meeting, if it's, if it's true that this thing called music that we're participating in is not only life affirming, but life altering, it is our moral obligation to make sure that it is given to our public as profoundly as possible and as genuinely and honestly as possible. And that requires a lot of work on the front end. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Classical music in some circles, not least academic circles, has, has a bad reputation. And this takes me into, as it were, the, um, well, particularly the recent surge of racial tension in particular. But classical music is, it seems to be entrenched in whiteness, in colonial structures, uh, in Europe, and all its past sins at a time when racial, racial sensitivities are at, their, at this very, very high level, surely classical music is about the last thing we need. Hmm. How, how would you respond to that? Um, first of all, let's stipulate that even if we all looked alike in our society, we would still find a way to separate ourselves because racism and classism and tribalism is a human phenomenon. And as a human race, we are all fallen. Okay, so I have to always stipulate that first. So I'm, so I'm living in an honest sphere in my mind. The second thing that I wanna say is Beethoven's, the slow movement to Beethoven's Seventh Symphony isn't profound because Beethoven is white. The slow movement to his second symphony is profound because God gave it to him. We don't own music. It was here long before us. It will be here long after we're gone and we will never live up to it as human beings, which is why it requires some humility on our part for the fact that the three of us are fortunate enough to be involved with it at the level that we are, okay? There's no other explanation for why I would hear a symphony orchestra at eight years old coming from the environment that I came from and, and find my life's call. It did not belong to any of the white people in the orchestra who were playing that music. It was God giving it to me. So it's a misnomer to believe that somehow classical music uh, is only for the privileged or only for people who look a certain way. You know, James Taylor said, I don't think I make up the songs. I, th I just think I'm the first guy that gets to hear them. <laughs> so we've got to be about the business as artists, especially now in the 21st century of getting out of the way and making sure people have access to all of it and not being so concerned with the labels around it. So I just talked to a, a Boston reporter yesterday in an interview who wanted me to say that the BSO has not done a good job of making music accessible. And have I seen the transformation? And that wasn't the right question. The question should have been, um, is the BSO, has the BSO always been willing to make sure that people of all stripes had access to it? And the answer is probably no, but only because we didn't make a proactive choice about it. That's all. It wasn't because we believed that people who didn't look like a certain thing didn't belong in the concert hall. We just didn't have it on our radar. 
Um, and, and most orchestras in the classical music business didn't have it on their radar, um, yeah. but uh, now it is. And the question is, don't talk to me about the past, talk to me about what you're gonna do about things yeah. now. Absolutely. John and Elizabeth, um, has the recent series of crises uh, put these matters on the agenda very much for you? And, and how do you see the future playing out? Well, I I just love what Thomas says so much. Um, it's, it's so beautifully and eloquently put. It's difficult to add to that. Um, I I love what he says about music being not only life affirming but life altering, um, and the fact that the music does not belong to us. It doesn't belong to just the the composer who who wrote it. I just I absolutely love that perspective, and so I think moving forward, the challenge is for us, and it is a challenge um, because it isn't just for us, how can we make sure that more people have, have access to that? I mean, when I look back in, in my own background, um, I had parents who, who loved music so much it was played in my house. Um, I had parents who were happy to pay for private music lessons. I was in a public school system that had uh, not only a band, um, but an orchestra. I actually played in a high school orchestra, which is uh, not, not always the case or often not the case. Um, and so, um, and I, I, had, I had parents who were happy to um, cover Juilliard pre-college tuition. So all of that, um, I, I, was, I was able to be in, in youth orchestras. So I just, I had this incredible advantage of, of exposure and support. Um, and so I think a lot of the the, the challenge for us is is how how can how can we broaden um, yeah. how can we broaden that? Yeah. Here, the, the the thing that we have in our hands is beauty, and the thing about beauty is that when we're in the midst of it, we understand how superior it is to us, and in in and when we come to that understanding, humility becomes makes 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 itself known. And um, we 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 don't we don't even, we don't even want to spend the energy thinking about the otherness when we're together in the midst of beauty. We only want to focus on the the, the beauty itself, um, and that that's the that's the thing that we have. But what I what I have said, and in fact, I also said this to our staff at the BSO. In our core, at our very core, we need revival, um, and that requires. Um, uh, a, a humility and a, an understanding of a, of a brokenness uh, and a repentance. And repentance is a verb. It's not a noun um, uh, in this instance. So, um, and, and I, that's gonna be our challenge as artists is to bring people to that place of spiritual revival. Fantastic. We've mentioned the COVID thing once or twice throughout all of this. Are there, um, have there been, upsides in all that clearly the huge distress in the performing community that must be registered but are there things you've discovered about music making that that's made you grateful in some way for for what's happened or for what you've been allowed to see i was given the opportunity to teach for an online christian flute music festival for for a week um i hated the computer aspect of it <laughs> I, I, I just, I, I was not, I, I still have not, I, we're going to get, the vaccine is going to be here before I figure out screen sharing. Um, I, but, um, but one of the great things is that we, we each had an opportunity to share our, te our testimony with, with the group. And, and I kind of thought, well, what would I, what would I choose to talk about? And C.S. Lewis came to mind and, and I thought about his, his book, Miracles. And there's this great chapter called The Propriety of, of Miracles in which we tend to assume that a miracle is a, a violation of, of nature. And, and he says, well, what if this is what nature was meant to be all along, but we're just not, we're just too dumb. We just, we just, we're not seeing it. We're not getting it. And because I think because COVID was such a, an immense challenge to, to, all of us to you know um, to to our sense of, of time and, and even and even structure um, that it it really made me think about the 
the surprise, you know, just a few really personal times in, in my life where God has really, really profoundly surprised me timing wise and provided me for with with things kind of far in, into my adult life that I was I was not at all uh, not at all expecting, but of course of course he had in mind all along. And that that was a really just the the way I was thinking through C.S. Lewis and, and what he was saying in that incredible chapter, and then also just really being able to reflect on my own life and what some of the things that God has done in, in, in my own life was just a really, it was a really sweet moment to, to, to share what he does. Thank yeah. you. Thomas, what about yourself and COVID? Any reflections there? You know, Elizabeth makes a strong point about her reflection. And it's, it, it reminds me of a thing that I, I'm often reminding myself and especially my, my, my four accountability buddies that I have is that we have to rehearse sometimes when we're in the midst of standing still. Um, and we have to rehearse and, re and by rehearse, I mean, we have to go back and remember all the times we thought we were in deep yogurt and God actually pulled us out of it into something else. And we, you know, we, I, I'm guilty of always trying to out God, God, you know, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to guess what the outcome's going to be, and it's, you know, over and over again, we're, we're, just, we're just knuckleheads at this, right? Because we all do it. And God goes, you don't have this answer. Why don't you work on what I'm giving you right now? You know, so, um, uh, so that's, that's, that's this, I'm really grateful for now that we can, now we can use our, this music when we get back together uh, to help kids be less afraid. Folks, I don't know how to thank you. It's been an extraordinary conversation. You answered all these questions and talked with such grace and honesty and opened yourself to us in a way that's, uh, that's taught us a great deal. I've learned a vast amount. And so, so thank you from all at Duke.